Top 5 Most Mysterious Drownings More than 3,000 people in the U.S. die from drownings each year. Some of these deaths are accidents, while others seem to be far more suspicious. The cases on this list are of the latter. These are the top five most mysterious drownings. Number five, Durham Pool Trio. It happened late at night in June of 2018 at the Chapel Tower apartment complex in Durham, North Carolina. Most of the residents there were sleeping and had no idea four friends had jumped over the fence at the Chapel Tower community to go swimming. The group had beer in tow and decided to take a dip in the swimming pool a little past midnight. But by 3 a.m., tenants in the building woke up to frantic banging and pleading as one of the members of the group went door to door asking for help. The tenants then discovered the bodies of three victims, 15-year-old Abril Flores Ojeda, Brian Benitez, who was 16, and 21-year-old Luis Delgado Romero. They were floating, lifeless in the pool, a fourth person, the only survivor who was underage, was left unidentified. Police were called in and paramedics arrived. The three were pronounced dead at the scene due to drowning, but how they actually died remains a mystery. Police interviewed the remaining survivor but have not disclosed information about what happened just yet. What's strange is investigators can't seem to figure out how all three people died at once. A spokesman from the Durham County Health Department said the pool was inspected two weeks prior to the incident and it was found to be in very good condition. Police have also said the victims didn't appear to have been electrocuted or show any signs of a struggle. Officials say they're investigating if there were some chemicals in the pool that might have caused the problem. Apparently, a previous incident at a YMCA pool in downtown Durham caused 40 children ages 6 to 12 years old to get sick because of pool cleaning chemicals reacting with each other, creating noxious fumes. The children reported vomiting, skin and eye irritation, as well as respiratory issues. Six of the kids suffered serious conditions there, but all recovered quickly after being treated. Currently, the investigation of how the three people in the Durham pool died that evening continues. Number four, Abby McGowan. On January 12, 2018, Abby McGowan and her family arrived at Iberostar Periso del Mar, which was just north of Playa del Carmen, Mexico. 20-year-old Abby had finished her first semester as a junior at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater, while her older brother Austin had a semester left before graduating at the same university. The two siblings went on a vacation with their mom, Gina, and their stepdad, John. After they settled in at the hotel, Gina and John took a walk while the siblings headed for the hotel pool. They swam around while taking several tequila shots at the swim-up bar. Around 5.30 p.m., John and Gina headed back to their room to get ready for dinner, and they agreed to meet the children at 7 p.m. in the lobby. When the time came, both Gina and John waited for them in the lobby, but after 30 minutes of them not arriving, Gina approached the front desk to ask them to call her children's room. The attendant looked flustered, rushed to call the manager, and it was then they broke the news that there had been an accident. Abby and Austin had been rushed to the hospital when both were found unconscious, face down in the swimming pool. 14 miles away at the hospital, Gina and John found Austin fully sedated, but doctors said his condition was stable. When he was discovered, he had a golf ball sized lump on his forehead and had suffered a severe concussion. But as for Abby, things were much worse. She was found unresponsive. In the hospital, she was in a coma, hooked up to a ventilator, and had no response to light, touch, or pain. The hospital said her collarbone was broken. Abby was then moved to a hospital in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Once in the U.S., doctors confirmed that she was in fact brain dead. Ultimately then, the family decided to take her off life support. After her death, her family continued to question as to what really happened that day. The coroner officially ruled Abby's death as an accidental drowning. The family believes otherwise, though, and have continued to ask for agencies, including the FBI and local police, to look into what happened when she died. Austin, while surviving the ordeal, could not recall what happened. The last thing he remembers was joining a group of guys to do a shot, which they did. Austin said he wasn't sure what type of drink it was, but he thought it was a Jaeger bomb. Toxicology reports after the incident showed that Austin's blood alcohol was 0.26, while 
while Abby's was .25. There were no opioids or drugs found in their system. Austin still can't believe no one saw what happened to them and that there was no full investigation performed. The family also pointed out that the Mexican police only interviewed three members of the hospital staff after the incident. The family tried to open the case about Abby's death, but the police refused since they considered the death an accident. As for the resort itself, speculation was rampant that they may have served some sort of tainted alcohol to Abby and Austin during that time. However, the resort has denied this. Apparently, officials in Mexico have seized about 1.4 gallons of tainted alcohol from establishments like clubs, bars, warehouses, resorts, and more. When ABC News inquired, the Mexican Health Ministry said resorts in the area don't have records of tainted alcohol being seized from their properties. Today, despite the questions, no one has any answers as to what exactly caused Abby McGowan's drowning. Number 3. Point Pleasant Party On July 10, 2017, 19-year-old Jelani Webster, Anaya Prince, who was 23, and Kyle Thompson drove to Point Pleasant Beach in New Jersey. All three consumed alcohol throughout the night and eventually checked into a room at the Beach Amethyst Motel. They then hung around the pool there while continuing to drink. But by 5.20 a.m., a 911 call was placed by a hotel guest saying someone by the pool was not breathing. This guest said that she heard a knock on her motel door and found a woman asking for help. The caller's husband jumped into the pool to help pull Anaya out, but by this time, she was already not breathing. When Kyle was asked what happened, he said he didn't know or see how Price ended up in the pool because he was walking towards their motel room when he heard a splash. When he rushed out, Price was in the pool, and since he couldn't swim, he directed Webster to start knocking on the doors to ask for help. Thompson, meanwhile, climbed down the pool ladder, holding on to it while reaching for Price, but he couldn't grab her. During the investigation, surveillance caught Webster pushing Price underwater in the deep end of the pool, knowing that she didn't know how to swim. Then during the trial, despite pleading guilty in connection to Price's drowning, Webster was acquitted of the murder charge. Although she is currently held in prison without bail for further charges and indictments related to the incident. What made it confusing was that prior to the accident, the two women were hanging around the pool and characterized as horsing around. At one point, Webster jumped in the pool, even if she didn't know how to swim, at the urging of Price. She began floundering and Price went in to save her. It was unclear whether Price dared her or not, and in the end, despite the confusion, Webster was sentenced by a judge to six and a half years in prison for the crime. She was also ordered to pay $7,360 in restitution to the victim's family for the funeral and medical expenses. Number 2. Sarah Widmer On the night of August 11, 2008 in Cincinnati, Ohio, Ryan Widmer arrived home after a long day at work. He and his wife Sarah had dinner and watched TV like any other night. After a while, Sarah got up to take a hot bath upstairs. She kissed Ryan and asked him to check the doors before heading up to bed. Later in the evening, Ryan went upstairs after watching a football game where he found Sarah unresponsive in the bathtub. He dialed 911 and told the dispatcher he thought his wife fell asleep in the bathtub. The EMTs arrived within six minutes. They performed CPR and rushed her to the hospital, but to no avail. Sarah and Ryan had only been married for 114 days. But during the investigation, even the paramedics thought something didn't add up with Ryan's story. During the 911 call, the dispatcher asked Ryan to remove Sarah from the tub and place her on the floor. He went away for 29 seconds, came back to the phone, and said he had moved Sarah and that she was now in the bedroom. Then he was instructed to attempt CPR. But when head detective Jeff Braley looked at the crime scene, he found the master bedroom floor and towels perfectly dry. All he saw were a few droplets of water and the tub looked otherwise undisturbed. It was suspicious that a woman submerged in a tub of water would not be soaking wet when pulled from that tub, especially under such frantic circumstances. So suspicion fell on Ryan and by his own admission, he was the last and only person in the house with his wife that night. However, his friends and family say it was impossible for him to kill her. What's more, they said Sarah had a habit of falling asleep in the oddest places. They explained that they had found her falling asleep at the dinner table or while riding in the car. 
She also fell asleep in noisy places or in the movie theater. One of her friends used to joke that she had narcolepsy, but Sarah said she was just tired all the time. But according to the pathologist who examined her, he found unusual bruising on Sarah's scalp and nape of the neck. Then, just days after the incident, Ryan was charged with aggravated murder. The first trial for what was dubbed as the bathtub murder happened in 2009. The dispatcher testified he got a lot of information from Ryan while on the phone and he seemed calm, something unusual during an emergency situation. What's more, the EMT on the scene pointed out Sarah's body was completely dry but her hair was damp when he administered CPR. In the end, that first trial resulted with the jury proclaiming Ryan was guilty of murder instead of aggravated murder, the latter indicating premeditation. But this first guilty verdict wouldn't stick for long as some of the jurors were accused of misconduct. As a result, the verdict was then thrown out. A second trial was performed which resulted in a hung jury. Then a third trial went on in 2011. This time, prosecution brought in Jennifer Crew as a witness. Crew said she was in communication with Ryan for some time and said that he had admitted to her that he had killed Sarah by punching her in the chest but the defense blew past Cruz's testimony, questioning her character. Still, Ryan was found guilty. His first parole hearing is set to take place in July of 2025, and so far, his appeals have been denied. No one knows for sure if he really killed Sarah, or if she died as a result of falling asleep in that tub. Number one, smiley face killers. Did it really happen? For decades now, the theory of the smiley face killers has remained a popular topic. During the 90s and early 2000s, 45 cases of deaths among young men found drowned in rivers or lakes all throughout the United States has been theorized to be non-accidental, but instead the work of a serial killer or a gang of killers. Retired New York police detectives Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte, along with Dr. Lee Gilbertson, a criminal justice professor and expert in gang behavior from St. Cloud University, are the primary advancers of this theory. According to them, since as early as 1997, they found evidence that could link up to 45 mysterious drownings and deaths. The victims, all college-age males, were found dead in or around water. They were often last seen leaving bars or parties after they had been drinking and seemed to all fit a similar profile. Athletic, popular, good students who were mostly white. The detectives believe the men were killed by an organized group dubbed as the Smiley Face Killers since Smiley Face graffiti was found close to where the bodies were found in at least a dozen of the cases. Of course, other police investigators dispute the claim that a serial killer gang might be operating in various states. Instead, they point to alcohol as the killer. They also say that the smiley face graffiti is far too common to be considered as anything more than just that. But Gannon argues certain investigators do know about the existence of a possible group that might be behind the killings, calling them domestic terrorists and that they communicate with each other over the dark web. Recently, Oxygen Channel released a series highlighting the case focusing on six of the possible victims. One victim, Dakota James, disappeared in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on January 25, 2017. He was 23 and was walking home to his apartment at 11.30 p.m. after drinking with friends and co-workers. He was last seen on surveillance entering a dark alley, but was never seen alive again. His body was discovered 40 days later in the Ohio River. Police believe he fell from a bridge close to the city center and his body traveled 10 miles through a dam before it was discovered. But what's odd is that there were no signs of damage to his body and a smiley face was spray painted in an underpass close to where his body was found. In June of 2005, 22-year-old Todd Gieb disappeared from a bonfire party close to his home in Kasnovia, Michigan. Three weeks later, his body was found in a lake, an area that had been searched prior when he was reported missing. The ruling for this was undetermined drowning. Then in 2006, Lucas Holman, who was 21, disappeared from La Crosse, Wisconsin, which is also where several clusters of deaths have been reported. He was celebrating with friends during Oktoberfest and went bar hopping. At 10 p.m., he headed home with a friend, but got separated during their walk. His friend ended up in the ER with a head injury. He was picked up by police, but he couldn't remember anything that happened that night. 
Holman was later found dead in the Mississippi River. His death was also proclaimed as an accidental drowning. These are but a few of the cases said to be part of the body count of the mysterious smiley face killers. The prevailing idea is that if this is a group of killers at work, then they are abducting and holding the young men for some time before drowning them and ultimately dumping their bodies into water to make their death seem accidental. What they're doing exactly while they hold the victims is unknown. While there's still no hard evidence linking all these crimes together or the fact that there might be an actual gang of killers, many of the victims' families also feel something's amiss with how their loved ones died. It's possible the men drank too much and tragically fell into the water in an accident, but still today, no one knows for sure and the theory of the existence of the smiley face killers remains a possibility. So there were the top five most mysterious drownings. Death comes in all shapes and forms, but sometimes certain deaths are a bit more sinister than others. In these cases of drowning, there certainly seems to be more than meets the eye. We have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday, so please remember to subscribe to our channel because you won't want to miss out on what's coming next. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.